This is a weird headline. Hunt Showdown. Games baked in Germany. Chili beans. We made it! We're out! That was crazy. James, you may want to see where we're expected to land. Oh, good. That means a soft landing on all those physical cartridges. Exactly. Well, you all know the drill. Rapid review rundown time. We only cover games we've, we've played, played a significant portion of or beaten, beaten that, that released between January and when we write this video, and we haven't reviewed separately. separately. Alright, we're ready to land. Anytime. At any moment. I think marking how much time we're in the air will only make it happen when we least expect it. I could have sworn it was going to happen in the middle of your sentence. Oh well, I guess we'll land after we begin. I finally figured out what I like so much about this game. It took me a bit and it's kind of a stretch, but hear me out. There's nothing to do but that, so go on. You play as Viktor Shulsky, a Russian badass who returns home after his father dies mysteriously. He has to overcome his own psychological traumas and his past to confront his sister, friends of the family out to get him, and these ghostly creatures that help Victor read strong emotional traces from things left behind by different people. You spend most of the game snapping your fingers so these red flakes of intrigue can tell Victor where to go, what to observe, and help him solve stuff around Warsaw. This is really cool. Gotta admit though, my eyes glaze over every time I find something that isn't specifically a conclusion or something that guides me to another quest because because there is so much reading. A random piece of paper will give you insight into how the world works, the side characters you meet once, and the side quests you can take on through essays worth of words. So much reading. However, you gotta find this stuff because it gives you experience points to power up your ghostly creatures. This review isn't very rapid. I'm getting to it. All of the world building and interactions are top notch and do an excellent job of seating you in the theater for the different cutscenes you view and the characters you learn to hate. Then it sits you up for the combat. Here is the point I wanted to get to. The combat reminds me of Paper Mario. You you are a guy with several types of attacks that execute in different lengths of time. You'll only ever use the ones that act the fastest. Then you have your ghostly friends, your partners, with their own types of attacks making each one useful for specific fights. The thaumaturgy points you earn with each level up can be spent on powering up your thaumaturgy, which net you abilities you can equip badges that can change the effects each attack has. Put the one that interrupts enemy actions on your quick attacks. It's like equipping the sleep stomp. It's really fun. So you like this game because it's like another game. This game is great because the story is well told, the world building is noteworthy, the side quests are easy and you encounter most of them on your main quest, and the conversations between Victor and his sister Ligia are the best moments in the game. They're written like siblings, they rib each other, look out for each other, care for each other. They're not written like two people who live in the same house with a cat, who play video games every weekday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time at twitch.tv slash gateway to drill bit. Yeah, sure stranger. How original, a drilling game showing up on the Gateway to Drillbit channel. It was only a matter of time. Pepper Grinder doesn't feel like it was built to be a full adventure game. Sure, you go level to level collecting five big coins, thousands of dollars worth of gems, and spending them on stickers and different colored outfits. There's enemies to beat, bosses to defeat, and you dig through concrete. But nothing scratches the same itch the first level, nay, the demo did. I played through almost the entire game without ever feeling that sense of wonder and joy the first level presented. This isn't a bad game, I just think there isn't enough to make it into the genre it is. This would have worked better as an arcade game where you dig for as long as you can, collecting gems, spending them on better, faster drills, and get high scores to compare to others around the world. Sounds like a miss. If you like a handful of ideas stretched across about a dozen levels with time attack stuff and a difficult to understand story, then this is for you. However, it is a miss for me. Have you ever wanted to be bored and confused to tears at the same time? After nearly a dozen hours of gameplay where battles will yield no rewards, the only way to get stronger is to pick a fight with the biggest thing in the room, lose, then bash your head against that same wall over and over until you win, and there are all of two cutscenes in the entire game? Then The Legend of Legacy is for you! Legend of Legacy's unique take on grinding will have you apologizing to every other RPG. Each battle with an on-field enemy will net you nothing most of the time. You could fight a series of seven spear-wielding bugs who stun you into submission and still end up receiving no money, no items, no healing, and no experience points. Fun side note, there is no experience points. The only way to net actual buffs in this game is to seek out the bigger, stronger, extremely dangerous enemies like this giant ass bird and engage in a war of attrition that it will win, all the while using your measly abilities to unlock more, gain pitiful amounts of strength for them, and finally, losing. What do you do after losing, James? You return to the one single village in this game, 
heal up, then repeat the process. I'll take Pokemon grinding over whatever the fuck this is. The Legend of Legacy. It's a worse version of Alliance Alive. Just go play that instead. Berserk Boy is a game in desperate need of a physical guide. Not only is it a game where abilities you get later will have uses in earlier levels to get collectibles and rescue NPCs, but it may explain all these inconsistencies that still have me approaching this game at arm's length. The animation is great, the different forms are fun, with very few having actual uses, and level progression is fine, but sweet spatula, some consistency is simply too much to ask, isn't it? But you like games with transformations, quests to complete, the ability to bounce on and punch things to cause them to explode, and begin with a pre-installed double jump and wall slide. What went wrong? You are Berserk Boy, a teleporter. Your goal is to find and teleport citizens in each level while beating up enemies and reaching the end. There are various problems that arise with even that. Even the formula of the game follows. For one, each person you rescue fills an amount of meter that appears on screen. But no rescue fills a consistent amount. In a single level, you rescue someone worth 20% of a bar, then another worth 10, and another worth 15. Why? Why not make it consistent so I can keep track of my progress? For replay sake? That does seem like it was built to intentionally cause problems. That and the fact the alternate paths you actually find the other people to rescue are so difficult to find, specifically early on when you don't have the drill claw or the other useless powers. A game guide showing where they are, explaining how much each rescue is worth, and why they're different amounts would be really helpful. Although I'm not sure it would return me to this game. I crashed it because a lock-on glitch occurred and caused the game to crash during a particularly difficult level. So this is a no for me. Enjoy it if you like this, but I can't stand not having a surefire way to keep track of my progress in-game. Wow! Inefficiency is fun, isn't it? Princess Peach Showtime seems to think so. The world finally gets to take control of Princess Peach in her second solo adventure as she kung fu fights her way, doop, as she wrangles up enemies, doop, as she sings songs dressed as a mermaid. Stop it! Princess Peach always feels like she has more agency when she's paired with the Mario Bros, doesn't she? Showtime is an inefficient game. On every floor, you have a few levels, and in each level is an individual setting where Peach has a different occupation with its own abilities. Only once you beat each of those levels do you unlock the boss, and then beating that gets you to the next floor, where there's more levels, all with their own settings. I think what bugs me is that, because there's no consecutive level themes, every level has a warm-up, the sequence which holds holds your hand and walks you through a refresher course on how to navigate this particular theme, and only after that does the level properly kick off. There is no skip button or fast forward, nothing. Not only does this make remembering any of the levels impossible, it also makes for playing the game downright insufferable. If Showtime had a more typical system of having a western world containing every western themed level all in a row, and then a mermaid world containing every mermaid themed level, so forth and so on, I think the game could have been greatly improved. Also, it's boring. Straight up boring. Don your different wigs, belts, and abilities, and bore your way through each inconsistent level on each scattershot floor. To begin, did you know this game is a sequel? There's an entire pile of lore your eyes can glaze over that I was entirely unaware existed until I was looking up boss strategies, because almost every boss in this game is a series of you praying you dodged in enough time to not get caught in every single boss's combo attack, which will kill you every single time. You are the Striver, someone who was tasked with taking down the Acolytes of Ire to return it to something that doesn't resemble the hellscape it is. I don't think anything can save the various areas you explore. Most of it's destroyed or uninhabitable. What? There's a volcano, a glacier, a dilapidated tent point taken. Also, this game won't allow you to take clips of all its jank on the Switch, so please enjoy the footage from the trailer because there are so many moments where this game broke and one where it crashed. I got stuck in stairs, fell through plenty of floors, enemies appear upside down and teleport across fields to kill me, and rewards for side quests you complete were never received. This is an incredibly janky, very difficult game that desperately wants to be your next Souls-like obsession. There are really only two things to like about this game. The weapon variety and the fact the loading screens are so long you can check your phone between levels. Not like any of these essay long bits of lore will present any bit of understandable information anyway. But all of these terms and capitalized letters must mean s yeah, point taken. This will shock you, but I did not enjoy the hour or so of this game I played. Andy will now speak for a while. 
Yes, I will! Balatro is a roguelike, and if you've ever heard us talk about roguelikes around here, you probably know how this is gonna go. But honestly, Balatro is such a cool idea. It's a deck builder using the most ubiquitous deck in existence. Theoretically, the player doesn't have to learn any new rules. Unfortunately, the roguelike aspect has you starting from absolute zero every run. There's extremely little meta progression, and it occurs slower than the decay rate of styrofoam. To the game's credit, there's a button you can press that just unlocks everything, so if you want to try the complicated challenges but don't want to grind through the thousand runs, you can do just that. But honestly, even with that, I just couldn't get into Balatro. There were a lot of runs where I'd have some incredible Joker combinations loading up on planet cards and buying up every voucher, until some boss blind would very precisely kneecap my strategy and I'd be kicked back to the beginning. And I'll never be able to get that particular strategy back since everything is random and there are so many Jokers. I think the nail in the coffin for me while playing Balatro was playing the first small small blind every run. The game rewards you with money based on how many hands you play and how many discards you use, which makes sense. You get treated better if you play better. But the problem is, the first small blind can be defeated in one hand if you happen to get the right cards. So if you want to be as efficient as possible and earn the most money, you just keep restarting your run until you can beat the small blind in one hand. It's irritating. More games should have god mode unlock everything modes. I'm not personally a fan of them as I don't use them, but Andy seems to like them. Step aside, James. I have something to start this one. I have a new rule, and I'd appreciate it if everyone followed it. If you're gonna make a platformer search action game, you have to have a cool new power in it. It seems all too often that we play a Metroidvania and the progression of abilities gets a bit predictable. Oh, that ledge is too high, guess I'll be able to jump higher later, that kind of thing. Prince of Persia, though, has abilities I haven't seen used in the genre before, and I think they're used pretty well. There were a number of times when I was simply perplexed by what the game just handed me, and I had to experiment against random walls and enemies to figure out what I could do. I agree with that rule. This is a very fun game with tight controls and awesome combat. The exploration elements remind me of some of the better Vanias out there, and it makes the first several hours of this game and the last bits where you're searching for collectibles some of the best parts in the game. There could be a few more teleport points, that would be nice. Beyond that, this game is glitchy. In fact, during the final boss fight, the boss went through a sequence of attacks and just as he was about to execute the final bit of his combo, he stopped. He stood there. Completely able to be struck, he just didn't move or react to my strikes. Their HP still ticked down, but they were no longer moving. I don't want to say I won on technicality, but I did win. Hey, a win's a win. I'm hoping it's better now that it's been out for a while. That way I can recommend it more wholeheartedly. Because it is a good game. Even with the glitches. It may not have the elusive e-reader levels or the scrapped level designer, but it does have co-op! This version of Mario vs. Donkey Kong is certainly the definitive, as it adds in new challenges, new sets of levels, and a nice coat of paint specifically during co-op, which we are incredible at. Oh no! Ow. Dang it! Dang it! Dang it! Booza! Do the how! Okay, are you ready? Are you ready? First hit. Andy. Yep, I was the first hit. <laughs> Do, do, you do, do. glaggles! There it is. One. Why did I run to the right? I knew what was gonna happen. I could see it. It's mathematical. I didn't know how much two players were going to add to this experience, but the answer is a lot. This became a completely new game for me that rebalanced the difficulties of the original game by allowing player two to be a functioning member of the level instead of a hat and took away stupid things like fall damage. I was a fan of the original on the GBA, but this version is, and Andy will agree, the, the definitive, definitive one. Well, this looks like a sprawling overworld that is entirely too huge to ever find anything. That's why there's these handy barriers that pop up every time you stray from the linear path this game presents you. Until you reach this weird test space looking area. All bets are off for most of this. I got stuck under the level. So anyway? Plushy from the Sky is a game about you playing as a child who can equip one of four plushies to have pillow fights with enemies until they fall over and give you experience points. You spend those on increasing your abilities, which are also altered by the plushie you have equipped. These areas appear to be full of different enemies and aliens until you come to an end of a level and fight a boss that acts more like a balloon. Until it furrows its brow and gets serious. Then it disregards any rules of logic and tries to break itself to kill you. But 
maybe that's the point? There's a very dark story about this game that you don't really understand until the end. It's kept from you to an almost frustrating regard, and I honestly almost gave up. But the end really brought it all together. This game classifies itself as a Souls-like, but I'd probably call it a Souls-lite. Good! More stupid terms to muddy the genre games can fit into. I'm happy about that. It has your basic souls like shit like a stamina bar, but your dodge has enough iframes to fill an Ikea, and you can easily overpower most bosses. With the barriers that keep you on track, collectibles that give you better healing are also easier to find. Just make sure you break the rocks on your way. This game is pretty fun and has its various challenges if you're looking for a souls-like game with a childlike coat of paint on it. By the way, we landed in the next room. Turns out, a lot of the games we bought in the first half of the year were digital. James was prepared for a pile of cartridges to land on. There were very few. He is in pain. Laugh it up! Ha ha! I know about the three-point landing. I'm cool. Anyway, did you play any of these games? What did you think of them? What games did you play in the first half of the year? Tell us about them in the comments, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching!